Hi, I'm Jason Horsler at the Hook Recording Studio and this video lesson is a walkthrough of this book. This is George Lawrence Stone's Stick Control for the Snare Drummer and it is one of the most important drum books that's ever been written. Uh, when I talk to a lot of other drummers, they spend a lot of time just on the first three pages. So that's page 5, 6 and 7. Those are really significant pages and there's a lot of goodies there. But I think uh, what people tend to do is stick on those three pages for years and not explore the rest of the book. So in this video, I'm going to push into the rest of the book and give you some help with that. Um, that said, I will also have a look at those first three pages a little bit as well. Now, I'm going to assume that you own one of these and I'm not going to show you any of the manuscript during the video. I'm going to refer to page numbers and exercise numbers and I would strongly suggest that if you've got this book you take it out, um, pause the video and go and get it and get your pad and your stick set up and we can work together otherwise you're really wasting your time. For the whole video I'm going to put the camera over here so you can see my hands and I'll talk you through it from there. Let's go. Alright, here we are set up, ready to go with stick control. If you read the preface, one of the things George Stone suggests is playing each rhythm 20 times without stopping. Uh, I found that quite uh, distracting when I was first going through the book uh, many years ago. I found that trying to count 20 bars or, or 20 pairs of bars while encountering an unfamiliar sticking pattern was just too much distraction. So what I suggest Instead of 20 repeats, play each exercise for two minutes. Have a, a wristwatch that's got a second hand and play along uh, for two minutes on each exercise rather and then you can rather focus on the hand pattern and getting used to it. One of the things I do for the first three pages is I play an exercise at a medium tempo and then double the speed. So for example, if we look at exercise five on uh, page five, it's a paradiddle. Lots of the rudiments find their way into this book, incidentally. And what I'll do is I'll just play it and then double it. So I'll go. And this way you also get a bit of practice at accelerating. The First 72 exercises are not an exhaustive search of all the possible sticking patterns, but they are pretty musical ones, and George Stone's given us a really good selection here. I still further like to select my way through the book, and I strongly suggest you do that too. There's just too much stuff in this book otherwise. So you'll see, in my book, for example, I've got lots and lots of highlighting and pencil marks and stuff like that. I really am against writing in books, but when it comes to drum books, I think um, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of person. Um, a drum book, if you've been using a drum book for 10 years, like I've been using this one, it should look like this. It should be dog-eared and post-it notes and lots of writing all over the place and things crossed out and new ideas. And You can even see I've stuck extra pages in the back and lots of things like that. This is a really useful working document for me and it should be for you too. If it still looks brand new in your hands right now, you need to get in there and really start breaking into the book. Those first 72 uh, exercises, I would strongly just recommend, you know, recommend just playing them for two minutes each over a period of six months, just getting really used to the sticking patterns and evaluating them for yourself as a drummer. Which ones do you prefer? Which ones do you think are going to be more useful for you? And those ones, you know, make a note of which ones those are. I just used a pink highlighter and then come back to them and do them even more often. So, so, for example, uh, number 33 on page 6 is a very, very useful sticking pattern uh, made very popular by Stanton Moore, one of my favorite drummers uh, in his New Orleans type drumming. Um, and it goes like this. Right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left. So you can either play it straight or you can start giving it a bit more of a swing. The 
some of these exercises are more useful for certain techniques than others. So for example, I've used um, number 23 on page 5 to practice my finger technique. But let's move on to some of the pages that a lot of drummers hardly ever visit. Page number 8. So what we have over here is four eighth notes and then two triplets. So that will sound like this. One and two and three teeter, four teeter, one and two and three teeter, four teeter. I like doing these in little batches. So for example, we can do five, six and seven, um, one after the other. I might do each one twice. Skipping over to page 10. One of the things I've liked to do in this book is try and make some of the exercises hand-to-hand -hand exercises when they're you sort of single directional. So for example, on page 10, if you look at 13 and 14, they're mirror images of each other. Uh, so what I do is I cross out the last half of 13 and the first half of 14, and I draw a little arrow between the two so that I move from the first half of 13 into the last half of 14. And that gives me a hand-to-hand -hand pattern. So I'm going to play it between the two different surfaces of my pad, nice and slow, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Right, left, 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 right, left. And I do this quite frequently throughout the book, so I'll show you a few more examples in a minute. Let's now jump to page 16. Page 16 is a very significant page, and I think it's one of those ones that a lot of drummers who only are looking to cherry pick four or five pages out of the book, they should spend some time on page 16, as much time as you spent on five, six, and seven, to be honest. Um, exercises 1 to 18 are the foundations for everything that follows from exercise 19 to 192. And in fact, to my mind, if you really drill 1 to 18, you don't have to become a genius at playing 19 to 192. I think George might have been a little bit too ambitious there. Uh, later on in your career, you can really dig in. But first of all, just ace 1 to 18. They are foundation, flam, control beats if you like. So what you've got over here for example number one is you've got a right flam followed by two lefts but the phrasing has to be like this one and a two and a three and a four so we're gonna go number two is left flam followed by two right Now, what I like to do is also mess around with that phrasing. Even though George hasn't written it in here, I like to mess around with that phrasing. So instead of going one and a two, you should also explore one e and two e and. So that would be like this. And exercise two would be. Um, you can also explore a triplet feel for these. So that would be one, two, three, one, two, three. And exercise two would be. So I'm going to play exercise one again, and I'm going to play it through each time changing the, the phrasing. Starting with George's one, then moving to one E and two E and, and then into triplets. Here we are on page 24 now, and these are the short rolls in 6-8. Um, so I count them as 1, 2, 3, 1 and 2 and 3. 1, 2, 3, 1 and 2 and 3 and 1, 2, 3, 1 and 2 and 3 and 1, 2, 3. From one of our previous examples, I like to take, for example, number 7 and 8 on page 24, play the first half of 7 and the last half of 8 and you get a nice hand-to-hand -hand pattern. 
So that would go like this. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Maybe between two sound sources. And you can practice that until you get really smooth. Let's have a 13 briefly and see what's happened there. So it's still the same phrasing, but now just the stickings change to double strokes. So what you end up with is a seven stroke open roll, which you'll see is what he wrote in the book. So that goes right, left, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, left. And then we can take 19 and 20 and do a similar thing to them. We can take the first half of 19 and the last half of 20 and we get this. Right, left, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, left, right. We are on page 25 and we are looking at number 13, which is three notes followed by eight notes. So you could count it as one, two, three, one E and a two E and a one, two, three, one E and a two E and a one, two, three. What I like to think of is big quarter notes and then just subdivide them into three or eight. And as you see, as this video progresses, uh, we'll look at all sorts of uh, subdivisions. Then we'll have a look at 19 and 20 and once again we'll take the first half of 19 and the last half of 20 and we'll put them together as a, a single hand-to-hand -hand type exercise. Here we go. Now we are on page 27 when we have a looking at uh, three notes followed by 10 notes and those 10 notes will be played as 11 stroke open roll. So uh, once again it's to do with the subdivision and what you're looking at is playing in your head big quarter notes and subdividing by three or by ten. That's number one. I prefer three or four because those ones are hand to hand. So let's just briefly have a look at number four. Uh, now we're on page 30, combinations in 3-8. And the way to count this is to go one and two and three teeter. Now I know it looks like it's written as sixteenths and stuff like that. I don't really bother with that. It's all about counting as the framework to get the phrasing right. Uh, and if you want, you can count it as one e and. Uh, but I just prefer to think in bigger, simpler uh, numbers. It's easier to count one and two and three teeter. One and two and three teeter. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left. Because these exercises are not too difficult, it's quite a good idea to do these in batches as well. So once you've experimented, you'll see that some of them work quite nicely one after the other. Uh, so, so things like four, five, and six or something like that. I'm just going to cherry pick one. I'll do number 22, just to just do something a little bit different. And I'll use the different uh, sound sources. So that would go one and two and three teeter.
You might have noticed that I'm skipping quite a few pages each time. Uh, I think some of the things uh, really don't require much explanation. So for example, I don't think I need to explain number 49 on page 32 because it's just doubling up on your tempo. Uh, so let's skip over to page 34, which is another one of those extremely important pages. So if I had to only choose five pages out of stick control, I would choose five, six, and seven, and I would choose page 16, and I would choose uh, page 34 as the, the five pages that I would work on most before uh, trying to attempt to work through the rest of the book. So what over here we have just flam triplets and some dotted notes and uh, exercise 1 through to 12 are the key to being able to play all the exercises that follow all the way up to exercise 54. So it's uh, rather crucial. So what you have over here, for example, is a right flam with a left right and a left flam with a right left. So you'll see there's a rudiment right there. Uh, the dotted notes, uh, the one thing I will say with these, you've got to be careful to make sure you end up playing these as dotted notes. There is a tendency towards making them into a shuffle as you speed up. So I'll demonstrate what I mean. So you're going to go... 1 E and R 2 E and R 3 E and R 4 E and Now watch what happens when I start speeding up I start shuffling so <laughs> I love shuffling so it doesn't matter but you should be doing something because you you want to do it and because it's what you're setting out to do uh, sometimes uh, if you find you can't do it any other way it means you need to practice the other way to make sure you can do it fast as a dotted note but we are on page 38 and now we're looking at subdivision of four notes in a quarter note to three notes in a quarter note that's the way i think of it that's the way i play it in my head and that's the way i'm going to be counting it play it at a medium to fast tempo Now you use that to help you play number nine. So what you'll start seeing is that certain patterns in the book become the check patterns for certain other patterns. So for example, number nine is a good exercise to follow number one because you're just doubling up on the big slow triplet there. So let's have a look at what that would sound like. So that's four into six. And so, for example, exercise 2 is the check pattern for exercise 10, and so on and so forth. Now we're on page 39, a very useful page. We're going to move from subdivisions of 4 into subdivisions of 5. Uh, there's lots of different ways of counting 5s. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, or just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, however you do it, one of the best ways to, first of all, warm up for these uh, eight exercises if you like is to first of all just play accented fives so you're going one two three four five one two three four five So with that one, you really want to just conquer number one until you're very comfortable with it, and then you work in number two, three, four, and so on and so forth. Number one is the check pattern for number nine, again. So if you can play one, then you just need to play one really slowly, and then start doubling up on your strokes when you come to the, the quintuplet. 
So this is what number 9 sounds like. So a subdivision of 4 flowing into a subdivision of 10, played as an 11 stroke roll. You'll notice that I'm slightly accenting the first note of each subdivision, in other words the, the quarter note. That just helps me keep an uh, awareness of where the pulse is. Once I'm really, really comfortable, I'll try and get rid of that accent as well because it's a crutch. Um, it's a useful one and obviously it's very musical, but you also need to be able to play these without those accents. And then if you want a real challenge, try and add accents in some of the odder places and still not lose the phrasing. Let's have a look at page 40. So what we're having over here in page 40 is divisions of 4 to subdivisions of 6. Um, so we just have a look at the first example. Now, this book is by no means perfect and there is a bit of redundancy in the book. I discovered uh, number 5, 6, 7 and 8 on page 40 are exactly the same as from 9 to 12 on page 38. So, you know, I just crossed them out. Uh, but they're the same. So you don't have to really practice those because you've already done them somewhere else. Number 1 on page 40, the one we've just done, is the check pattern for number 9. So here we've got a subdivision of 4 into a subdivision of 12, which is a 13 stroke roll. So all you're doing is you're taking the original pattern and you're just doubling up the strokes in the 6, in the six tuplet. Uh, so that's going to sound like this. Righto, we're on page 41 and now we're looking at a subdivision of 4 followed by 7. And there's lots of different ways of counting 7 of course. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3 or 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or if you like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, se. It's hard to say the word 7 because it's two syllables. However you count it, take it easy, take it slow. Similar to the 5s, uh, we could start by playing an exercise where we just accent the 7th note each time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you become used to just bunching sevens with an accent, and you start thinking of that accent as the chord note and play it along to the metronome. Alright, time for number 9 on page 41, and number 1 is the check pattern for number 9, so if you can get used to the phrasing in number 1, you just double up on your strokes on the septuplet, and that will give you the 14 strokes that you need, which turns to be turns out to be a 15 stroke open roll. So, let's give it a try, and see what it feels like together. Alright, we're on page 42, and number 1 on page 42 is 8 strokes as a 9 stroke open roll into 5 strokes, and so the check pattern can be found on page 39, number 1 on page 39, the 4s into 5s, 
has now become the check pattern for 8 into 5, so we're just double stroking the 4s. Uh, so this is what it sounds like. Number 17 is a 9 stroke open roll leading into a sextuplet. So the check pattern will be number 1 on page 40. Subdivision of 8 into 6 is what we're looking at here. We finish our video lesson on page 43 with the uh, exercise 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, these are subdivisions of 8 into 7 and for me personally I found these the hardest exercises in the whole book to uh, nail because uh, 8 is so similar to 7. Uh, it's a real subtle deceleration as you shift between the two. Um, the best advice I could give you if you're battling with these is to spend some time practicing just accented sevens like this. And so you become really used to bunches of seven. Uh, so you would spend more time in some of the other pages in the book and then you would come and try and conquer this one. Um, the check pattern is um, on page 41, it's number one, so if you spend a lot of time practicing uh, that check pattern, then come to do this one, it becomes a little bit more stomachable. Let's give it a try and play it together and see how we go. Thank you for watching. Uh, you'll have noticed I've missed out quite a few pages and that's because George Stone often does little summaries and combinations of stuff. So what we've looked at is the fundamental exercises in the book. Once you've conquered those fundamental exercises, do go back and start doing the combinations. And then the next step is to take the book and the pad and apply it to a drum kit. I hope this has been useful for you and keep watching, please subscribe. I've got lots more videos up my sleeve coming down through the pipeline and we'll catch you on one of those. Cheers.